Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Laura Caroline Delara. I'm the director of the DePaul Art Museum, and I am thrilled to be able to share this space with you today. I want to make note that DPAM's mission and vision is to really connect people through art and ideas, and there is nothing more exemplary in that than this exhibition and publication and the teams that have been brought together in order to do it. So with that, there is also, of course, a load of people to thank for the incredible work. Um, the fact that this exhibition has brought so many new generations to come to an understanding of the incredible hard work and the dedication and care that goes into reparations, both locally and globally, is so very well evidenced in this show. And to be able to bring that to new audiences and to new generations, I want to thank with immense gratitude both our curators, but also those that have been deeply involved with this work for decades before the show even came to, to fruition. Along with that, I also um, would like to briefly thank um, those organizations that have specifically helped us to get us all in the room this evening. So along those lines, um, the Center for Constitutional Rights, the Illinois Humanities and their Envisioning Justice Grant, the Posen Center for Human Rights at the University of Chicago, and DePaul's Vincent Endowment Fund have all helped to um, support this evening's programming. As long, um, along those lines, I mean, obviously we've learned from the last few years, and it's also really um, exemplified in the gallery of portraiture, our first gallery downstairs, that the naming of names is so crucial and important to this work. And I had fully planned to go through that list of names, but I also know that Amber and Aaron are going to do that too. So. Um, I want to tell each and every one of our essayists, our poets, our artists, our collaborators that this poignant work that you have done for decades and are allowing us to share will be so important to us and will be engaging with that material for years to come. So I appreciate you all so much for allowing us the space to do that. Um, to our studio, uh, Toby Albright and Molly Edgar, thank you so much for your continued work with us, your amazing patience, your guidance. We could not do this publication without you. They um, designed and produced this entire beautiful tome, and we are so appreciative of the dedication and look forward to continuing that work with you. Um, I also would be remiss if I did not thank the Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, which gave major grant support to the museum for both the exhibition and the publication, uh, and really provided us the means to be able to build a platform for raising our collective voices together. So I'm so appreciative to them. In addition to that, I also want to thank our incredible DPAM team. Um, our associate curator, Uni Behar, and our collection exhibition manager, David Marazella, whose like, incredible work, dedication, commitment, patience, and care in the work that they do, I am awe and inspired by every day. So thank you both to Uni and David, as well as each of our student employees here at the museum. We are a tiny full-time staff. And our student uh, interns and DPAM delegates are really, we could not do this without them, and the museum would not exist without them. So many thanks to our students as well. And certainly to Amber Ginsberg and Aaron Hughes, our guest curators, co-collaborators, I cannot say enough, and I cannot think of two people who are more passionate and more dedicated to the work that they do. I also am so in awe of and have learned so much from watching the two of you save space for everyone that you touch within your sphere and continue to bring along in your work. Um, I so am appreciative of the both of you for trusting myself and my team with this work, both in the exhibition and the publication. Um, and yeah, appreciative of all of you for being in the room with us today and look forward to hearing from our contributors um, and just being able to really celebrate this incredible hard work, um, not just what has happened over the last few months with the exhibition and the publication, but also uh, you know, just dedicated to the work of reparations in general. 
With that, I also want to mention, obviously, the publication is for sale this evening. In order for DPM to continue to be able to do our work, please consider purchasing a book this evening. I can promise you it is a beautiful, beautiful example of the real sort of dichotomies that Amber and Aaron have presented in the exhibition. Um, engaging both with poetry, artwork, essayists, all in the same book to really be able to show just such poignant, beautiful examples of how hard but important this work is. So with that, I will turn it over to Ever Ginsburg and Aaron Hughes. Thank you. Thank you, Laura Caroline. It's true. This is going to be a night of thank yous, and it's just because we are continue to learn so much from everyone we engage with, and I'm just going to do my best to just contain my absolute excitement. So first, in return, we also want to thank DePaul Art Museum, Laura Caroline, you've been amazing, David, Yonit, um, Zoe, who did all the photography, um, Matthew, who has been doing so much to get people here. Your unending support has been really profound, as well as all the student delegates who really are the face of the exhibition to all the people who come. Thank you so much. Um, you know, there's a lot of thank yous. There was a lot of people in this book, so we appreciate you guys sitting with us for a minute. Um, the Center for Constitutional Rights, uh, we want to thank them for sponsoring this event and just mentoring us and being a key ally over the last decade of work. Um, and all the organizations that partnered to help bring this exhibition and publication together, the Prison and Neighborhood Arts Education Project, the Invisible Institute, Closed Guantanamo Coalition, Heal and Recovery After Trauma, Heart. Uh, Chicago Torture Justice Memorials, Chicago Torture Justice Center, close, um, oh, sorry, I was jumping ahead. <laughs> Reprieve, Cage, we always collaborate. Witness Against Torture, Northwestern Medill Journalism School. Um, and of course, um, our friends and allies and collaborators, Mashan Ali Hendricks, she has this amazing installation just to our right, Sarah Ross, Maha Halil, Beth Jacobs, Brad Thompson, Trevor Paglin, Chris Arendt, uh, Christina Rivers, Jane Beachy, Jerrica Arendt, uh, Kathy Kelly. Mark Templeton, Mary Patton, Mary Zirkel, Monica Trinidad, Julie Yost, Nate Sandberg, Lucky Pierre, the Hyde Park Art Center, About Face, Veterans Against the War, and American Friends Service Committee. And a uh, special thanks to our mentor and our friend, Michael Rakowitz. Um, yeah, a lot of this work has been inspired by being in dialogue with him. And now to the book, while you guys are all here. Uh, remaking the Exceptional Publication brings together uh, activists, artists, poets, and torture survivors to investigate and resist the ecosystem of violence that connects Chicago to the US military prison at the illegally occupied Guantanamo Bay Cuba. Uh, the book is edited by Amber Ginsberg, uh, Leah Hussain from the Center for Constitutional Rights, Audrey Petty, and myself. This really beautifully designed book and illustrated catalog is interspersed with poetry and artworks, pairing formally and currently imprisoned artists, creating a visual dialogue across carceral systems. The aim of the publication is to uncover real moments of beauty, poetry, and shared humanity within and despite the traumas of state violence. Um, these flowers, we're gonna give them to all of the artists and everyone who sort of helped in the book. So when we transition outside, um, there's a lot of people here who are directly involved in the book, and we hope that you all find each other and can ask questions and talk to each other um, and this is part of connecting the local and the international struggle against state violence and the ongoing demands for restorative justice and reparations. Um, we want to thank the contributing essayists, uh, 
Carrie Leiderson, the Medill School of Journalism Research, um, from Bali Pereira, Alexander Schur, Kelly Milan, uh, Margaret Cates, Maria Mendoza, uh, Marie Quaja, who is our wonderful MC, and Maria Mendoza with the Invisible Institute, Spencer Ackerman, Aliyah Hussain, Alice Kim, Asim Pulley, Mansoor Daifi, Mark Volkoff, and Tempest Hazel. And we want to acknowledge the nine interviews in the book whose words are downstairs in the installation and part of the beautiful Remaking the Exceptional podcast. We want to thank Kilroy Watkins, Mozambique, Dorothy Burge, Latanya Jennifer Sublet, Mohamedou Otslahi, Ronnie Kitchen, Mansoor Adaifi, Sabri Al Karashi, and Anthony Holmes, many of whom are here with us today. We'd also like to thank the artists in the book, Ghalib al Bahani, Sabri Al Karashi, Khalid Kasim, um, Ahmed but um, Badr Rabani, Mohammed Ansi, Harun Gol, Abdul Malik Abd Abud, Damon Lux, the Chicago Torture Justice Memorials with Joey Mogul, Mar Molly Crabapple, Jamal Esme, Devon Daniels, Daryl uh, Wayne Fair, Carlos Ayala, Dorothy Burge, Debbie Cornwall, Sarah G. Ree, Mark Sullivan, Ricky Caseda, Robert Curry, Daryl Canyon, and Abu Zabaida. It is a nice, thick book. <laughs> uh, and wait, there's still poets. Uh, <laughs> Al Bahani, uh, Eric Blackman, uh, uh, Slim Hugh Penny, uh, Tara Betts, Carla Sarah, Mozambique, Majid Khan, Frank Lopez, Anand Fernand Abdul Latif, Jamal Adorsi, Woods Bottersman, Botter, Devon Terrell, Sheikh Abraham Aman, Amir, excuse me, Johnny Taylor, Fernando Marti, Osman Abu Kabir, Sabir Turk Turkestan, and Sheikh Abraham Muslim Dost. Our editor, uh, editors, uh, Kevin Basil and uh, David Mar Morizella, and designers Molly and Toby, uh, thank you so much. And a last note, um, where there won't be quite so many thank yous, the last program of this incredible exhibition um, is this Sunday at 3 p.m. Get out your phone, start registering, because it's something not to be missed. The uh, abolitionist um, dance company has been hosting events. This is, final one is the 51st Free State Project, also in the room next door which synthesizes a year-long series of conversations as part of the Prison and Neighborhoods Art Project, PNAP, to most of you in this room, at Stateville Prison, and imagines what a 51st free state might look like, sound like, move like, developing a dialogue across the prison wall, a dance and sonic interpretation of time and space. Damon Locks and Anna Martin Whitehead will activate the installation through sound and movement, not to be missed. Okay, finally, to the program. Uh, now let's introduce our amazing speakers. Myra, gosh, I'm, I shouldn't read at all. I think it's smart to you guys, but we didn't want to forget anybody. It's like, it's really nerve wracking. There's so many people. Uh, Myra uh, is an artist, writer, and educator. She works at the Invisible Institute where she is the director of public strategy and a managing editor of the Chicago Police Torture uh, Archive. Um, Dorothy Burge, who I hope we're close enough that I can call Mama Burge, is a fabric and multimedia artist and active member of the Chicago Torture Justice Memorial Memorials. Dorothy is a Chicago native, but comes from a long line of closers. Uh, Mansour Daiki uh, is a writer, artist, and activist from Yemen. Mansour survived military torture and detention at Guantanamo Bay. Latanya Jennifer Sublet is an organizer and mental health worker at the Chicago Torture Justice Center, where she directs the peer reentry program. Latanya survived police torture and detention in Illinois. Mahamadou Old Slahi is a writer of Guantanamo Diary and is. Uh, that became the film, The Mauritanian, 
Uh, Mohamedou survived military torture and detention in Guantanamo. Anthony Holmes is an activist and public, public speaker. Anthony survived police to torture and detention in Illinois. Bahar Azmi is an attorney who served as a legal director for the Center for Constitutional Rights and led the, the team of pro bono lawyers who filed the 780 habeas corpus cases on behalf of all those in prison at Guantanamo. Aislinn Pulley is an organizer who, co -found, who was a co-founder of Black Lives Matter Chicago and is also co-executive director of the Chicago Torture Justice Center. My name is Myra Kwaja. I work at the Invisible Institute, a journalism organization on the south side of Chicago. And we were so honored to be a part of this exhibit with Aaron Amber. It is a dream come true to collaborate with them. Um, I am moderating today, and my contribution to the exhibit is research, which there's a piece downstairs, an interactive map that Mahin also worked on, um, and Maria Mendoza. Um, and in the, in the map, to briefly, briefly summarize, because we're, we're going to keep this program moving quickly, um, the map talks about the connections between Chicago police and the U.S. military. And these are understandably connections that we don't fully get to understand or know. It is not public data or knowledge who has served in the military, who is an active, act, serving on active duty while still receiving salary from Chicago police. But the basic premise is that our military economy really incentivizes police officers to also have served in the military. There's active recruiting from veterans, as many people know. Um, job prospects for veterans are also not great, and police um, salaries provide a stable opportunity, right? Um, and so the, the map will talk you through different geographies in this world and connections between when people have served, you know, served in the military, right, come back and work in the Chicago police, and then potentially again go abroad and train national police, work with militaries abroad, um, and just to give you one example, because again, it's a lot of names that you'll see in that map. Um, Dante Servin, does anyone here know, remember the name Dante Servin? He's a Chicago police officer that in 2012 uh, killed a 22-year-old black woman on the west side of Chicago named Rakia Boyd. And there was big protests, uh, sustained activism, to fire Dante Servin. And this will be familiar to a lot of the survivors of um, in the John Burge era, but Dante Servin got to resign a week before his firing hearing. So he got to keep his pension. And today he lives and works in Honduras training national police there. So there are a lot of active histories um, that a lot of people have written off because now we're like, okay, Dante Servin's not in Chicago. But the struggles in Chicago are connected to the people in Honduras, right? The, the struggles in Iraq, in Pakistan, in Guantanamo Bay are connected. Um, a most infamous example that I write about in the book is focuses on Richard Zuli, who, while is not named in many of the Burge lawsuits, is very much of that era. There are many survivors of torture um, by Richard Zuli in Area 3. Um, and he is also known for having tortured Muhammad Zuslahi, who we have the honor of having us join, joining us tonight. Uh, he is the author of Guantanamo Diary, and I really hope you check it out. Um, so that is very brief. The chapter is long, the exhibit downstairs is long, is long, but I'm really hopeful that slowly but surely we can start understanding the struggles that we face and the work we do in Chicago. It's not hyper-local or not just domestic, but something that is really truly in solidarity and learning from the work that has been done internationally. Um, so thank you all for being here. I would love to bring up our first speaker. Um, the, the format of tonight, I think, will be really special. Um, there are eight speakers who will speak briefly about their work, uh, focusing specifically on how art actually is a tool of resistance, when it has been a tool of resistance, um, and we can see it in the ways that art making and expression has been repressed. Um, so each person that comes up will speak briefly and ask a question to the survivor or person that speaks after them. So I hope that you all enjoy the dialogue um, over the course of the next 45 minutes. Thank you so much for being here and opening yourself up to listening to these stories. Uh, Ms. Dorothy?
Please join us. Thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate it. And I just wanted to say very briefly that I am an African-American woman who quilts from the perspective of an African-American woman and mother. And so my quilts illustrate the issues that are important to me and the fact that I worry as a mother, as a aunt of nephews and nieces, as a sister of four brothers and two sisters about the safety of the people in my family and the people that I know and love. So I wanted to start off by saying I think art has a really incredible uh, power to move people, to educate folks, and to also move them into action. And so I want to read a letter that I got after I created a quilt about Trayvon Martin uh, being killed, and Trayvon Martin killed in 2012. And when I was protesting, I was wearing my nephew's uh, hoodie because I didn't own one. And the more I wore the hoodie, the more I could smell him, and the more emotional I became about how Trayvon could have been my nephew. So I created this quilt, and the quilt was on display, and I got this letter that I'm going to read. Dr. Maslumi. Dr. Maslumi is the head of the Women of Color Quilters Network. I took my son with me to see and still we rise at the museum today. I am a quilter, but by no means of the caliber of some of the women whose work I witnessed there. If I am lucky, I can get a square or two sewn while my son is napping, but I'm usually not that lucky. I couldn't stop and wonder at all of the tiny details and hand stitching that went into some of the quilts as much as I would have loved to because a baby in a stroller gets a little bored sitting in the same place for too long. <laughs> he was surprisingly chill about being in a kind of stuffy room, filled with stuff that mom liked, as long as I moved him along after a minute or two. Sometimes I said out loud, oh honey, I wish you were old enough to appreciate this as I was struck by the craftsmanship of one quilt or another. There was one quilt above all others that floored me. Trayvon Could Be My Son by Dorothy Burge. It stopped me dead in my tracks and filled my eyes with tears. I read the placard on the wall next to it. I even took a photo of it so that I would not forget her name and so that I could look her up once I got home. I strolled my son through the rest of the museum, but as we were about to leave, I went back in to look just one more time. Trayvon could be my son. I looked at my baby boy and tears ran down my face. It has now been many hours since we got home from the exhibit. My son woke up and I went and lifted him from his crib. As I sat nursing him in the dark, I began to cry again. I cried for Trayvon's mother, as I could not even imagine the pain of losing my son. I cried for Dorothy Burge, imagining her hands cutting the applique pieces, feeding the fabric through her machine, all the while thinking, my son could have been in the wrong place at the wrong time. My son could have been in the wrong neighborhood, wearing the wrong jacket. My son would die for no other reason other than he is a young black man in America. I don't know if she has a son, or as I am sure was the purpose of the title, the viewer would imagine Trayvon to be their son. It is now 11.40 p.m., and I could not find a way to contact Mrs. Burge online, just because I don't know how to use social media, which is <laughs> kind of surprising in this day and age, honestly. <laughs> So I'm writing in hopes that you can pass this along to her. I am 40 years old, and never has a piece of art made me cry like this. Thank you, Dr. Maslumi, for curating this exhibit. Thank you, Dorothy Burge, for making such a powerful piece of art that is keeping me up trying to find you so I can let you know how much it moved me. And now I would like to ask the next artist, Mansoor, Adafe, who is next, 
I would like to ask you uh, to tell us about a time that you used art to overcome a challenge. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dorothy. And first of all, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, important uh, event. It's actually the, I think the crown of all the work have been done by a lot of uh, talent, artists, writers, activists, all of you. So, and what make it unique, what make it, uh, makes it unique and important that the collective work from Guantanamo to Chicago to other places. So let us fly to Guantanamo. You know, art at Guantanamo was a way of, uh, it's one important means to overcome the challenges. It was a mean to survive at Guantanamo. Art of Guantanamo from Guantanamo actually came, started early at the early days, but the painting itself, it started like connect us to ourselves, to our memories. It kept us, uh, it, kept, uh, it kept our sanity. Start singing, dancing, uh, writing, uh, painting, you know, always challenging because the camp administration took it as a challenge, took it, uh, took it as a way of rebellious in the camp, especially when you have collective singing in the blocks or dancing or laughing. So being that everyone is, uh, it was taken as a threat in the camp because they, the, interrogators, the interrogators need to keep everything in control. They need to keep pushing everyone, trying people collapse. So uh, we started, uh, we found a way to actually escape Guantanamo. It's not physically, but someone can imprison your body, but they cannot imprison your spirit, your thought, your, that your freedom that within you. Uh, art from Guantanamo also, we treated like a, a being like one of us. Started Guantanamo, we hide it. It grows. It uh, it it was treated like one of us. It, some of the art was sentenced to, to death. It was uh, destroyed. Some of the arts managed to to uh, to uh, leave Guantanamo. It was art from Guantanamo. Also, is used in our PRPs to show that we have plan for the future. That we have, you know, we are good people. Again, we have to prove that over and over and over again. And Art Wong and Tenamo help us to do that. And thanks to the uh, artists, Aaron Thompson, Aaron Thompson, to Aaron and to Amber and to everyone who helped us to organize exhibitions and to bring the voice of Guantanamo because the Art Wong Guantanamo is the reflective of the people of Guantanamo, the reflective of the humanity in Guantanamo. And to have such an important book and put everything together, you know, it is a universal uh, language, a universal that connect us and bring us uh, together. I don't want to exceed my time, guys. Just let me know. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> so I think we share the same, you know, uh, the injustice because justice does not differentiate between color background or places, location. And what happened at Guantanamo actually started within the United States, not, in the, not outside of the state, because the people who did it, they created, they, just, they make the decision inside the United States. And honestly, my fear now is, is Guantanamo going to be created or duplicated in, 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 within the United States? Because I don't want anyone to suffer like the way we suffer. I don't want anyone to go through what we have been uh, through. Uh, I don't know what to ask, <laughs> but I would like, you know, to, yes. No, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no. uh, I would like to know about the, how the, you know, uh, uh, the camp, you know, the, the administration in prison there reacted to the art from the prisoners because at Guantanamo at the beginning, they told us your guys as a terrorist, you didn't know how to paint. They already have this kind of like stereotype about us. When we started talking to them and fighting, you know, you know, trying to find a piece of humanity, which is like art. It's not just for art. It is piece of, you know, piece of, you know, a uh, piece of us. And 
we know that we need to express ourselves. We need to get our voice to the world outside and to, again, like being in jail and being uh, accused of terrorism, you need to prove yourself. So I would like to ask uh, about how, you know, the prison administration reacted to, uh, to the art making or, you know, sometimes the good intention is not enough uh, for, from a prisoner or, uh, to to the to their captive because everything about you even like your behavior even designed as like you are uh, trying to get something or trying to you know try to to deceive the people uh, who's in charge thank you so much good evening everyone welcome thank you so much for being here i am happy um to be here again my name is britannia ten of course but one of the only women to come forward as a torture survivor. Um, to answer the question, when I um, was first in captivity in prison, um, the administration was really, really helpful with art. We could order art supplies, we could order sketchbooks, we could um, you know, have all kinds of journals and things. And then as the administration changed, um, they stopped allowing us to order from um, companies that would sell us art uh, supplies and things. And what the officers would always say is that, um, how were we so talented in, in prison? As if uh, prison was supposed to stop the fact that we were talented and smart. Um, so yeah, a lot of the officers would say um, that we were MacGyvers. If anybody knows who MacGyver is, it's because because they stopped selling um, the the art supplies, we were able to use like makeup, and we would steal steal um, chalk from the teachers and and use it for white. We would use you know eyeliner to trace certain things. So we became very very creative in how we were artistic in that situation. To Muhammad, I would like to know um, what do you do that brings you joy now? Thank you so much, Latanya. As always, I just want to remind you all that our brother Mansour uh, is stuck in Serbia and he does not have the right to travel. He's still under punishment. He's not a free man. He does not have the freedom to travel. And I appeal to everyone who could like, you know, apply pressure, uh, call their congressman, call their ambassador to allow this man after almost 20 years in imprisonment to live his life and let him be. Uh, thank you, Sister Latanya. Uh, like Masur said, one of the things that brought us a lot of joy is singing. You know, and I want to share with you uh, a poem that I took the liberty to uh, to translate from Arabic because I understand that most of the people in this audience don't speak Arabic. <clears throat> prison is my heaven and the prison is my hell. And I am the gambler and the stake. I, the darkness, and my bitter memories, and my endless waiting. The everlasting night of prison is wrapping me tight. And my anxiety, too, is wrapping me tight. The sun has risen over the world, but not over me. Oh God, forgive me because my heart is confused. I'm not complaining to anyone until heavens complain about raising seas. And uh, 
so any kind of uh, expression like writing or even drawing and because i'm not a very good drawer but <laughs> uh i remember i think it was one year one year before i was released i was allowed to meet the uh, teachers in the school and they started to teach me a little bit how to draw and i really find enjoyment because it gave me freedom uh, german say uh, papier is is geduldig meaning paper is uh, patient because you can't talk to the paper you can do anything you want you can write on it you can write poetry you can write your story you can draw on it you know and i remember i was sitting and then i said and there was no like there is no prospect of me going out of prison but i said i'm going to to draw the woman i want and then i made this drawing and actually i met that woman after i was released and this is something that is you cannot make up because i have the drawing and i have the woman that i showed her i said i did not know i would meet you and it was like crazy and i have this uh, theory that our subconscious that is the source of our creation creativity i mean uh, and the source of our art is this in, uh, um, interface with god with allah whatever you want to call uh, to call it and uh, it has no limit it has, it cannot differentiate between uh, future past and present it knows everything and uh, it's also the source of our dreams i, I remember you know <laughs> latani i remember one time i was i this song came out when i was in prison uh, señorita you know this song uh, uh, he came all the way from memphis tennessee and he's got I talk about this girl he'd met uh, and the sunny day i'd know i'd meet such a beautiful girl etc etc and then i went to sleep so i had no access i was in complete isolation and i heard this song from afar and uh, i went to sleep that's it i heard just some words and i memorized them i couldn't get them out of my head and then i went to sleep and then i saw in, in in a dream that the song was track track number 9 then i uh, when i woke up i dared ask one of the guard i said you were playing last night a song i saw in a dream that it was track number 9 and he was like okay let me check and he went to the shack wherever the guards were and he came back he said yes that's true and things like that and i'm sure uh, brother mansour ha had seen also a dream that were so clear you know and he saw them again so and uh, sorry for this very very long uh, answer and i'm just like uh, passing the baton uh, to my brother anthony and i want to ask him what brought you joy the most in those dark times that's a mean question to answer. <laughs> uh, I think, to me, after I got through with the bitterness and the, and the letdowns and, and just doing the time, I did go to working out. Uh, Nick and I did power lifting by the building. I wrestled in a box. Uh, that took up most of my time. 
But I think what really touched me the most was it was joy I got to see my family when they came to see me, my grandkids. And I'm just going to speak on one issue. So my three grandsons come to see me. My son brought them out. And they were getting ready to leave. And one of them came in and sat by me, the oldest one. I said, Granddaddy, I'm not leaving unless you leave with us. I said, how do you expect me to leave with you? I can't do that because I'm, I'm here for a child that I didn't commit. I got to go to the courts. And so I did. And I told him, I said, look, y'all father going to take y'all home. I said, y'all father going to come get y'all and take y'all home. But if you stay here like you told my joint, you're going to lose that privilege of being with me. So what I need y'all to do is, anytime you want to come to see me, just tell you that. He's going to bring me. And they looked at me. Then the oldest one said, Granddaddy, we're going home, but we're going to be back to see you. And that was one of the changes that I made while I was in the penitentiary. Because all that time, made me realize that I wasn't on one during the time. And that's what hurt me the most. But the sad part was about all of this was, the cases that they put on me and got me the time, I've been doing. I'm the type of person, if I do something wrong, fine. Because I was out there doing crazy stuff. You know, but the thing is, they didn't like me for what I did. They liked me for what I didn't do. And I did 33 years for that. And finally, I was able to come out. And my job was, when I came out, I met Flint Taylor, Joey Mogo, and others. And they helped me through, through the transition. And they made me realize that I got to speak on what happened to us. And so that's what I did. And luckily, what happened was, I was able to get John Burge. Because he was the one that got me and tortured me, suffocated me, electrocuted me. And but I'm here to say now, I'm still here. Yeah. The last thing I'm gonna say is this. With me and all the rest of us that survive, things we're trying to do now is help each other get through this each and every day. Because the torture that we went through, it never leaves. It never will. We can't, you know, we can't beat it. We have to live with it. Not let it spill off and have us be upset or do different things that we shouldn't do. But the main thing is we can't let it get us down. And that's how we stay strong and try to keep things doing what we're doing. I appreciate y'all being here. I appreciate y'all listening to me. And like always, we're going to be still here. <laughs>
But through it all, we survived it, we came out. I went to court to testify against Bird, I got him. I couldn't get his butt to drive because he died. But the bottom line is this here. What they took from us, we could never get back. But we're going to keep on striving to help others so they can have a better chance. This is what it means to us. Thank you. I think about it being acknowledged that we have been harmed, that we have been victimized, that we have been traumatized. When I think about reparations, I think about the fact that they never included women. We so think that police officers are such gentlemen that they would never harm women. They marginalize us and say that we're mothers, we're sisters, we're cousins, we're baby mamas, but we're not victims of police violence and torture and abuse. So when I think about reparations, I think about them asking me what I need. Don't just throw a blanket over us torture survivors and say, here, take that. Ask Latanya what she needs and no one has ever done that. Ask my mom what she needed when she left 26 in California without her baby. Ask her what she needs. Ask my community what they needed when I was taken, kidnapped for 21 years. Ask me what I need in this community that does not allow second chances. There are collateral consequences. Can't get a job, can't get an apartment, can't adopt a kid, can't do none of that. I can't even have a pit bull, because that's a violent dog, and I'm a murderer, apparently. So when I think about reparations, I think about a full second chance that allows me to be a free, indeed, citizen. Not a citizen with a label that says they're formerly incarcerated, they're ex-con, they're returning citizen. I want my slate wiped clean. I want, I want to be able to choose everything that I want. For every dollar that a non-incarcerated person makes, a formerly incarcerated person makes 60 cents. The reason why there's still poverty is because they will not allow formerly incarcerated individuals to really become middle, upper class. So when I think about reparations, I say repair the harm for Latanya, for Anthony, for Eric, for all of us individually. Acknowledge it that you were wrong and repair it by asking us what we need individually and what we would like to see collectively. So glad that you asked to come back up and share that. that was very memorable. Um, next, we have Bahar Azmi, who came to town with us. We're so excited to have you. You're the director of the Center for Constitutional Rights um, of Pro Bono Lawyers, who filed uh, 780 habeas corpus cases for all of those imprisoned in Guantanamo Bay. Thank you so much. Uh, so, um, thank you all for uh, inviting me, in particular thanks to uh, Amber and Aaron for the collaboration of the past 10 or so years. I've learned so much for you about the power of art and how to integrate art into advocacy. Um, I've been asked to talk about uh, Guantanamo um, and in particular efforts to censor um, the art there. Um, and I should say I'm the opposite of an artist. I'm um, a lawyer, but in order, <laughs> I want to, uh, in order, I think, help us appreciate the power and inspiration of these acts of artistic resistance, uh, to put these acts in context and to understand what the 
Guantanamo project was, and fundamentally to understand its authoritarian logic. Guantanamo was never a place to adjudicate guilt or innocence. It was never a place designed to mete out uh, punishment. Uh, it was a place uh, intentionally situated outside of the law and outside of any legal constraints so the United States military could conduct endless, lawless interrogations, brutal interrogations, and torture to inflict, in the words of a CIA manual, debility, dependence, and dread to excommunicate them from any associations in the outside world um, and make them, uh, it literally, in the, use the psychological term, impose learned helplessness so they became totally dependent on their interrogators. Um, and so the enemy of Guantanamo uh, was hope. That's why they denied um, access to lawyers. That's why they denied access uh, uh, to, to family. Um, so how does art become, um, uh, in this context, become a political phenomenon? I think it's also important to uh, recognize one of a number of um, lies that the Bush, Bush administration propagated uh, around uh, identity, uh, which was this totalizing narrative of um, a Muslim menace, um, undifferentiated, unindividuated, collective, uh, uh, set of dangerous people, and of course it was racialized um, as, you know, sort of um, an, an alien um, uh, religion everywhere and nowhere at the same time, uh, mysterious. I think of these connections as well. There's the, sort of the myth of the superhuman Muslim they created, which is not unlike myth-making in the United States around uh, black women uh, and, and men or girls and boys where we project that they are much older than they may appear to be or that they're impervious to pain. Uh, and so in the context of Guantanamo, uh, these superhuman Muslims were so dangerous, so menacing, so um, uh, brutalizing that uh, regular detention wouldn't work inside the United States. They had to be in an island prison. Regular interrogation were, wouldn't work. It had to be um, uh, enhanced. Um, so if, if um, they are this dangerous, this brutal, uh, we can place them outside um, the area of human concern. Um, and so art entered into that uh, world eventually when uh, uh, detainees got access uh, to lawyers, um, poetry emerged, small acts of, of art and resistance uh, emerged to destabilize these core authoritarian pillars of Guantanamo, hopelessness and um, a lack of individuality, um, and to send a message uh, to the world. Um, and it became so powerful that uh, in 2017, um, after a really beautiful um, exhibition of detainee art in the John Jay, uh, John Jay in New York, uh, dozens of beautiful uh, paintings and poems, um, that had, in the back of them, uh, been labeled with a stamp that said, uh, approved by the United States. Um, uh, the uh, administration became threatened, as they always had, by uh, the power of uh, this messaging, um, as all authoritarians uh, become, um, and then uh, set a policy of forbidding art. I should say, also, one sort of um, dynamic here is the art was getting into the United States and traveling across the United States, but of course detainees weren't. Um, um, and so even that they had to, to shut down um, and claim that the, the military claimed that the art was United States property, um, like the, the detainees. Um, and so there's a, 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 to show the importance of art, that became a pivot point in the advocacy to, to force the administration to um, uh, uh, allow art to come out of Guantanamo again um, with, with some success. And I'll just sort of close by saying that I mean, the, 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 you know, Guantanamo, art was uh, as opposed to like central tenets of Guantanamo, lies, violence, fear, and what this art produced was its exact um, opposite truth, love, and hope. And as a, as a lawyer, I think of our work um, as lawyers are trying to secure some rights as merely destabilizing Guantanamo, but in, um, when I think about the, the art that came out of there and, and, the, and the, the humanity that is exhibited, it's really art that will destroy Guantanamo. Thank you so much, Bahar.
Um, to close us out, Aislinn Pulley, who is a phenomenal organizer, many in Chicago know her. Um, she is a co-executive director of the Chicago Torture Justice Center and is also a contributing author to the book. Um, and she will be speaking to us today about um, the organizing efforts ongoing, um, what remains in the promise for reparations. We have not fully fulfilled all the promises laid out in that ordinance in 2015. Um, so she will remind us of what remains in this struggle and will read to us from the piece. Um, I do want to just share that as of 1.30, um, approximately 1.30 this afternoon, the Hernandez brothers were exonerated. <laughs> Will be released as of tomorrow. Oh, wow. um, and the Hernandez brothers are a part of another ring of forced false confessions that were led by CPD, um, a particular detective named Guevara, who has resulted in the exonerations of over 20 people. I think it's much higher, I think it's like 50. Yeah. Um, which is which makes it the largest exoneration group of exonerations in Chicago history, and one of the largest in the country. Um, so that is a, a really important victory, and there are other wins hopefully to come uh, uh, when it comes to the survivors of Guevara. Um, so I wanted to share that. I also wanted to just share that um, on Sunday, last Sunday, Melinda. Uh, I'm sorry, Madeline Miller um, was shot and killed uh, by police in Flossmoor. She was a 64-year-old black woman. Um, and uh, there hasn't been enough information around that. There will be an action on Saturday that will be in front of the Chicago Torture Justice Center, so at 63rd and Woodlawn at noon. Um, and we will be calling attention to her murder, as well as the murder of Jada Johnson, who was a 22-year-old black woman in Fayetteville, North Carolina, who was just killed a week prior after um, exhibiting suicidal ideation. Um, and so in Chicago, we have a treatment, not trauma ordinance, which would um, enable mental health crisis workers who are not police, who do not carry guns and are not connected to the prison system, to be able to respond to psychiatric emergencies so that people when in psychiatric distress can receive the care that they need and not a gun, and hopefully save lives. Um, so that's coming. Um, regarding reparations, there is a lot that still needs to be implemented in terms of er eradicating torture. Um, but very specifically, the memorial has not yet been made, not yet been built. And that's the, one of the biggest things that, have, that, that has not yet come into fruition yet. And so Anthony, um, who came up earlier, is also a leader in um, getting the memorial built. And his meet has been in multiple, multiple meetings with city representatives, um, with architects, with designers, uh, and we thought we were in the last leg of it. We, we have a site that was finally approved, um, and there might be a little more room for us to do some more work, it sounds like, but that has not yet been done. Um, so that's where we still need some public pressure and attention and support. Um, we also, the, the Chicago Torture Justice Center is, because of the reparations ordinance, the first and only domestic um, torture center in the country that's by design because the other approximately 15 sites, uh, torture center sites, um, are restricted by their grant funding from the government to only accept international torture survivors. So it was a result of the social movement that allowed and forced the reparations ordinance into being that was able to create the first and current only um, domestic uh, cent uh, center in the country that treats domestic torture. Um, and that needs to be protected and continually funded. The city has argued every year that they've already fulfilled their requirement. And so we do know that 
we have to continue, we have to be ready to push, to force the city to fulfill its commitment until torture has been eradicated. <laughs> and unfortunately, we know that torture still exists. Um, uh, one of the survivors from Guantanamo talked about fear that it would happen here, that a Guantanamo would happen here, and Guantanamo already exists here. We've already have it here. Um, and we have Homeland Square on the west side right now that still is in operation and has disappeared a conservative estimate of 7,000 primarily black folks. Um, so torture is alive and well in this city. So I'm gonna read just a little bit from my essay on shame and survival. Shame has the biological effect of death. Shame is the thief of aliveness and goodness. What torture survivors did and are continuing to do is remove the socially constructed cloak of shame that the system of policing has relied upon since its creation. Torture survivors refuse to remain silent. They refuse to make invisible their experiences of violence and death-making at the hands of the state and equally important, refuse to remain silent about the effects of torture on themselves, their families, their communities, and society as a whole. The courage, strength, and determination of torture survivors to not stop telling their stories has had massive, historic, and extraordinary impact. As Judith Herman wrote, the knowledge of horrible events periodically intrudes into public awareness but is rarely retained for long. Denial, repression, and dissociation operate on a social as well as an individual level. She goes on to explain, the conflict between the will to deny horrible events and the will to proclaim them aloud is the central dialectic of psychological trauma. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Anthony, beloved Anthony. I have his permission, so I'm going to, going to just share a little bit. Anthony Holmes was tortured for over 25 hours. John Burge, who I will skip the descriptors because I think everyone is familiar with, is the one who led the torture on Anthony in 1973. Cattle prods were placed on Anthony's chest and body and were connected to a black box that emitted electricity via a crank. There's a replication of that device in the exhibit. During 25 plus hours of death making, Anthony did actually die multiple times. His heart stopped. And the same perpetrators who electrocuted him had to restart his heart so that the mission of torture, which according to the United Nations is to enact power over another for the purpose of a confession, was achieved. Torture works to suppress the prefrontal cortex, where our highest evolutionary cognitive processes reside. It's where our ability to critically think sits, where we are able to perceive long-term consequences, all core aspects of what makes us human. The purpose of torture is to suppress our humanity, quite literally, by making it biologically impossible to access the highest evolutionarily developed regions of the brain. Torture triggers the autonomic nervous system's sympathetic and parasympathetic responses by delivering the threat of death and actual death to the human body. The most highly evolved areas of the brain are then shut off biologically in order to allow the body to enter into survival mode, which means our organism will then make decisions on how best to ensure the survivability of itself at all costs. This is the purpose of torture, to enact excruciating and murderous pain so overwhelming 
that the body's only response is to stop it. The use of shame, then, is not only extremely powerful, but should also be understood as another often ignored consequence of torture. After being forced into experiencing death, the survivor is expected to exist within an environment of psychological, social, and political shame. The arrested person becomes a social pariah. The incarcerated person is deserving of condemnation. The family of the incarcerated person is also to be blamed or pitied and ostracized. Shame, the shame response works to further advance the goal of torturers to make invisible the violence, the removal of choice, and to absolve themselves of any responsibility. The survivor is the monster to be scorned, to be forgotten, to be socially and politically killed. For the 100 plus years that torture has been a tool of Chicago policing, which is to say for the entire time of, of the existence of the Chicago Police Department, this recipe was used and reused over and over without much interference. It was not until the late 1970s and early 80s that survivors, attorneys, and medical professionals were able to desperately break the cloak of shame and silence that was the expected norm. In 1991, Burge was finally fired from the Chicago Police Department for the multiple accounts of torture that had begun to emerge. In the 1990s, Burge torture survivors on death row found one another in the study group and formed the Death Row 10, who alongside organizers on the outside were able to successfully force a moratorium on the death penalty in Illinois in 2000. A famous and for its time, first of its kind, study chronicled 18 people on death row across the country whose DNA proved that they were innocent of the crimes for which they had been sentenced to death. Of those 18 people, five were from Illinois. This, along with the activism of the campaign to end the death penalty, prompted then Ju uh, Governor George Ryan to invoke a moratorium. Illinois officially abolished the death penalty 11 years later on March 9, 2011. Still, the lineage of torture continues. Illinois, and specifically Chicago, carries the distinction of being named the forced false confession capital of the country. However, by returning to the power of incarcerated people who refuse shame, we see an integral element of social change. Despite the social disposability of their bodies and their entire existence, survivors, inspired by their need to tell the truth in the face of a society that built the largest incarceration project in history, in the face of a society that created narratives around gangs and the war on drugs to justify mass arrest and violence on specific populations, refused to accept silence and dared to speak and are keep and have kept on speaking. This audacity to reject the dominant narrative by repeatedly telling their own truths is central to the disruption of oppression, which needs to silence, deny, and erase lived experiences in order to maintain social order. It is central to inspiring movements for social change. And that truth telling that I would say prior to this iteration of movement, largely was relegated to survivors of sexual violence. And that's how we have understood shame. That's where most of the psychological studies have come from. That same shame operates the exact same way with survivors of all types of trauma. And so that pushes us Right? Once we understand that, that pushes us and calls us to action. How are we going to change? How are we going to change this system? How are we going to change this world? Knowing that Guantanamo exists in Cuba, it's an illegally occupied, uh, occupied land. Homan Square exists right here. So it is incumbent upon us now that we are 
here, all of you are already activated, but it's incumbent upon us to close down all of the Guantanamos that exist here, that exist in Guantanamo, and that exist all across the world. And it's incumbent upon us to make sure that Dante servants aren't in other Hondurases. Right? for joining us. I, I think you should you know, commend yourself to some extent because I know after spending the past year and you know, Amber and Aaron the past 10 years and anybody who's worked on this exhibit, it is not easy to sit with these stories. There's no simple answer for this, right? There's no like simple police reform to get rid of torture. So you are pushing yourself to think about some of our toughest questions of how do we close the Guantanamos? Um, how do we create a world in which a future, you know, John Burge is not raised? I think the, the point of the title we're making the exceptional is that this experience is actually not exceptional at all. There's not some magical thing that happened to uh, John Burge when he was in the Vietnam War that turned him into a torturer. You just need to look at the world in which John Burge grew up, um, the world in which Kenneth Boudreau grew up, Dante Servant grew up. And whatever ways you are committing yourself to creating a world in which uh, people grow up in a better and healthier way is a step towards preventing um, this pattern of abuse from continuing. So thank you again to all the survivors and artists and families and mothers of survivors for relentlessly telling their stories over and over again. Um, please do not stop. <laughs>